Tuberculosis is an airborne disease that is spread by droplets containing the organism Mycobacterium tuberculosis. South Africa is burdened with one of the worst tuberculosis epidemics in the world. TB is easily spread, especially in areas with a poor socioeconomic status. These unfavorable overcrowded living conditions, coupled with the high prevalence of HIV in our country, increases the susceptibility of the contraction of TB due to immunosuppression. When your body's immune system can no longer fight the infection, it can enter the bloodstream to infect other parts of the body, known as extrapulmonary TB. TB reaches the musculoskeletal system by hematogenous or lymphatic spread in roughly 5% of cases, half of which results in spinal tuberculosis, which is the most common form of skeletal TB. The clinical presentation of the patient may depend on the site of TB infection in the skeletal system. Common presentations include pain, which is insidious and may only present at a later stage when spinal destruction has already occurred, general malaise, a limb, and deformities such as gibbous and hip flexion deformities. Red flags to remember include night pain, constitutional symptoms of TB like weight loss and night sweats. They may also present with a known TB contact or history of previous TB infection. Always be sure to ask the patient of the HIV status as this increases their risk of TB infection. When examining these patients, do a full general exam to look for signs of lymphadenopathy, systemic illness and malnourishment. When doing a more focused exam of the affected region of the skeletal system, use the look, feel and move approach. Look for scars or sinuses, muscle wasting, assess the gait and observe any deformities. Feel for joint effusions, bargesinovial swelling, warmth and tenderness. Actively and passively move the affected area to assess range of motion and to identify where the problem may be. Finally, a neurological exam must be done as it may reveal any sensory and or motor fallout. Investigations to do include blood tests such as a full blood count and ESR, a full blood count may reveal a white cell count that is normal and platelets that are raised. An ESR may be raised in TB. A MANTI can be done and the result is usually positive. Keep in mind that false positives and false negatives may occur. A CT scan is indicated to differentiate early TB from pyogenic spondylitis and preoperatively it is the best way to assess involvement of the posterior elements. A blood culture is not very useful. X-rays of the chest and spine can be done. A chest X-ray may confirm pulmonary TB, and AP and lateral spine X-rays may be normal in early disease, but in late disease, typical features are paraspinal abscess, paradiscal vertebral body collapse, and kyphosis. MRI remains the mainstay of investigations. Sagittal MRI best shows extradural compression of the cord and confirms the presence of paraspinal abscess, spinal cord compression, and spinal cord signal. One may also appreciate the loss of CSF. A biopsy is mandatory to confirm diagnosis with the zeal nielsen stain. Synovial biopsy can show histology of acid phosphobacilli as well as a positive histology for caseating or necrotizing granuloma. Bone TB manifests in three ways, spine TB, joint TB, and cystic TB of the bone. With spinal TB, the most common area of involvement is the lower thoracic and upper lumbar spine, T8 to L3. Infection starts in the anterior aspect of the vertebral body, in the region of the disc, and at least two contiguous bodies are involved. Destruction of the vertebral bodies causes anterior collapse leading to an angular deformity of the spine. The infection can produce a paravertebral or extradural abscess, which can result in spinal cord compression and subsequent spinal cord dysfunction with paresis and paraplegia. With joint TB, the synovium is primarily affected and the patient presents with a painful swollen joint due to chronic synovitis. If the hip is involved, the patient may present with an antalgic or tendillin bone gait and limited range of motion. 
Features of chronic synovitis on radiographs include osteopenia with or without periarticular erosions, joint space narrowing, and joint destruction. This x-ray shows destructive tricompartmental arthritis with erosion of both femoral and tibial condyles along with periarticular osteopenia. With cystic DV, there is a painful cystic lesion of a bone with no joint involvement. The treatment involves curatage of the lesion in addition to TB therapy. This picture shows cystic DV of the scapula in a young boy. Managing these patients involves different approaches. General management, optimize the nutritional status of the patient, notify the disease, treat contacts and counsel the patient. Medical management involves TB therapy for nine months with four TB drugs at the full dose and extend the duration if necessary. Immobilize and splint the affected joints. Surgical indications include the drainage of large abscesses, decompression of the spine if the patient has neurological compromise, osteotomy for deformity, and arthroplasty for affected hip and knee joints. In future, rehabilitation with physiotherapy will be required for these patients. This is a case scenario to see how much you have learned thus far. An HIV positive patient presents to your local community health care centre with a four week presentation of backache, night sweats, night pain and fatigue. What are the steps you should take in managing this patient? Remember to take a thorough history, do a complete examination, perform the relevant investigations and decide on the best management. The important points for you to remember from this video always have a high index of suspicion for TB in the South African setting. HIV increases the incidence of extrapulmonary TB. Know your red flags. Treat TB and know the indications for surgery.